So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Doris Reflect Gallery. My name is Erin, and I'm the Exhibition and Average Coordinator here at the Gallery. Uh, we are pleased to present uh, Professor John Kennedy. He's here to present the lecture, Understanding Pictures and Vision and Touch, Lines, Perspectives, and Metaphors from Cave Art to the Present. Uh, Professor Kennedy has a doctor from Cornell and has taught at the U of T Scarborough for over 30 years. Since his first conference paper, Professor Kennedy's research is focused on the psychology of perception and cognition, with special reference to pictorial representation. His lectures on drawing and the blind have been presented in a number of art institutions internationally, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Smithsonian, the Met, the MoMA, the Stockholm National Gallery in Sweden. Of interest to artists and art historians, art historians, as well as psychologists, Professor Kennedy's theories on perspective have been seen as controversial. But are they really? <laughs> I'll leave that to Professor Kennedy to expand on. This coming fall, an exhibition based on his research will be presented by the Education Department at the Art Gallery of Ontario, as well as the, Man as the Manifesto Biennale in Spain. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Kennedy. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. It's a real pleasure to be here and to see so many friends and familiar faces. And it's also a real pleasure to have some students here that uh, come from far and wide at Scarborough and all kinds of areas that I didn't even know existed until they introduced themselves 10 minutes ago. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about pictures in vision and in touch. I'll tell you about lines. And uh, wonderful, Mary Peterson is here. I'm going to be talking about lines and figure ground, and Mary is the world's expert on figure and ground. So whatever controversial things I eventually say, she can tell you the truth <laughs> about them. And uh, I'm also going to tell you about perspective, and I'm going to tell you about metaphor. So thanks for the invitation to Aaron Peck. And uh, the controversial stuff here is uh, long and deep. This is a, a, a material, a simple material, inexpensive material from Sweden. It's a rubber board with a stiff backing. You put a sleeve, a plastic sleeve around it. We make it lightly textured so it's easy to use. We take an ordinary ballpoint pen and you run this across the surface and you get a raised line, a line you can feel. Isn't that interesting? Very simple. Well, in uh, Sweden, they made this for a couple of decades, and then they decided blind people could not understand pictures, and they stopped making it. They had a big debate, and a lot of people argued for keeping it and making it and distributing it around the world, and the people who voted against won. In Denmark, there's a wonderful little group there was making pictures in picture story books for the blind, for blind children. And they were told by the organizations for the blind in Denmark and Sweden and Norway, if you put pictures in this, we won't buy it because pictures cannot be understood by the blind and it will frustrate blind children and so we won't buy it. So she made her little books, but she had to put abstract shapes, squares and circles and little bits of fur and little bits of whatever shells and things into her books, and then she could sell them. Well, I, I also, within psychology, have lots of people who doubt this strongly. And within philosophy, Robert Hopkins uh, said to me, pictures for the blind, I used to think, were ontologically impossible. It's in the nature of existence that it would be impossible. So by the end of the day, I hope you'll feel what I'm telling you isn't controversial. It's common sense and obvious. But the implications of it are enormous. So I'm going to pass this around so everybody can have a shot at feeling this simple material. And what I'm showing you right away is a picture drawn by a blind woman from Toronto, Tracy from Toronto, codenamed TT in the publication on this. And you can see that she's drawn an insect, a dog, and a person. And uh, blind since age two and a half, has no visual memories, uh, lost her first eye at the age of six months, and it's because of c cancer that she had to lose the second eye. So probably her retinas never worked very well at all in her whole life. But nevertheless, she draws astonishingly well, and much like sighted children, I would say. And as you look at this, you probably can tell she's drawn the back of the insect. Now, you might say that's the insect from above. 
She's drawn the side of the dog, and you might say that's the dog from the side, and she's drawn the person from the front, the front of the person and from in front, as if she's got a, a decent sense of the, the vantage point of the observer. You will also notice that she uses lines here for uh, an object with a background, and she uses lines here for um, an elongated, thin object, uh, a stick, basically. And she uses a line here for something that has foreground above and foreground below. And the line itself is the, the mouth crack. It's, it's, the, it's the background, in effect. Uh, here are some more drawings. This is now Tracy from New York, and she has drawn a glass. Very simple, very clear. She drew a cat. I said to her, you know, how did you learn to do that? <laughs> did you have one of those cat cushions <laughs> that you go and buy in, in stores that are kind of fake rural, and then you put them in your urban house, but it looks so rural and sweet? And she said, no, this is my cat. This is the way my cat sits around. And this is her idea of a mouse. So she said to me she drew this using lots of circles. And she got the idea by listening to an interview on the radio with um, Walt Disney. And he said, yes, I used lots of circles when I first drew Mickey Mouse. So that's sort of her idea of Mickey Mouse. Here is a person lying down. Most people drawing a person lying down will sort of do a head and then a bit of a body and then the feet stick up. This lady has done something quite sophisticated. And the knees are bent beautifully. The calf muscle is shown. The feet are now flat on the floor. Uh, there's a little curve in the back. This is a sophisticated drawing. Most sighted people can't draw this well. Uh, you'll notice, too, when she drew a head, she put in that mouth line. So it's foreground on both sides of the line. Well, how many ways can you draw and use lines? So we need to study the lines on the page. And what I've told you so far is that lines are standing for surface edges in the referent. So there's the stuff on the page, and then there's stuff in the world that you're showing. On the page, there are line junctions. Lines are meeting each other. Mouth lines meet profiles, profile line. So those are junctions. What they're showing is corners and occlusions, or one surface in front of another. There are geometries. On the page, you might get converging lines. And what that's dealing with is the perspective on objects in the three-dimensional world. But in addition to getting everything right there, you might also violate all those rules. Uh, human beings are very good at understanding rules and then violating them deliberately. And when you do that deliberately, sometimes you end up with anomalies on the page but they are apt anomalies. They're like saying the man had a heart of stone. It's an apt anomaly, and it conveys a meaning. So, um, and I could tell you about development. Clearly, uh, some of those drawings that I've shown you, this person has drawn a fair amount in their life. And are, they're interested in space. They're interested in drawing. But they don't start at that level. They must start with scribbling and then move slowly to that level. These people have drawn on their own, by and large, and learned to draw on their own. So what you're seeing is a spontaneous development of drawing in the blind. The hypothesis I have is that the spontaneous drawing development in the blind and the spontaneous drawing development in the sighted is much the same. All you have to do is encourage them. I said to Tracy from New York, you know, did your parents teach you to draw? And she said, well, you know, I used to make drawings. I would show them to my parents, and they would say, that's nice, dear. <laughs> and then, you know, the drawing would go up on the refrigerator. And that's just like the sighted. By and large, most kids are not drilled. They're just encouraged to draw. I'm going to concentrate here on some things in cave art, and then drawings by Eriko from Japan and Eshref from Ankara. When Eriko was drawing, she would draw like this. I'll show you this drawing later. This is the size, scale, and you can see white lines, which I will convert to black lines. And uh, uh, Eshref is from Ankara in Turkey. Uh, the last time I gave a talk in which there was a, an art historian prominent in the audience, 
she said, John, you are despicably Eurocentric. <laughs> this is a little puzzling, because I'm showing you drawings from Japan and from Asia Minor. <laughs> but the uh, cave art will be from Europe. I will claim that Erico uses metaphors and can represent thoughts. Now, that's intriguing, isn't it? And Eshref showed perspective so well that, as Priscilla at the back may well remember in my class, when I would show an Eshref drawing and then say, OK, have a good look at this. And then I would put it on, and I'd say, no, you do that drawing. The sighted subjects in my class couldn't achieve the level of sophistication that Eshref achieved. So what are the possibilities for surface edges and lines? Here they are. There are six. Here is a stick. So there is background, foreground, and background. So there's ground, figure, and ground. Over here, there is the classic figure ground effect. Foreground, an empty background. Foreground, an empty background, ground minus. Down here, there is a foreground surface, and there is a well-defined foreground, sorry, background surface as well. So that's foreground and ground, but it's a well-defined surface. Uh, down here is a nice and interesting case. Here is a foreground surface and another foreground surface. But this foreground surface goes behind the upper foreground surface. Right? It con this one continues behind that one. So foreground on foreground. Then here we have a cracked line, like a mouth line. So we have um, surface, then background is the crack, and then surface again, or foreground, ground, and foreground. And here is a corner, which Mary calls a join of two surfaces. So there is a surface meeting another surface. Change of slant, but not a change of depth like those two. Those are the six possibilities. The one that is impossible is GG, ground and ground. There has to be a foreground for there to be a background. You can have foreground and foreground. That's a corner facing you, two surfaces joining. But you can't have ground and ground. There has to be at least one foreground surface. If you um, saw all those things clearly, you may have noticed that there were no shadows and no color patches being drawn in. If you want to show a color patch on an object, you have to shade it in. People do not just draw it with lines. If you want to show a shadow on a surface, you shade it in. You don't just draw the lines for it. Apparently, lines are superb at showing you surface arrangements, but they don't work for showing you borders on surfaces. So if you try to show a shadow with a line, people are often puzzled by it. They're not sure what it is you mean. So here's a shadow of a house on the wall, and people think, well, maybe there's a kind of little border around a garden there. Uh, why is that? Well, have a look at this. There's a red line here. You will notice, if you can see this one, um, younger people find this a little easier than others, apparently. Uh, you may be able to tell that there is an object in shadow here. Uh, can you? Oh, good. Nick's nodding his head. Uh, can most of you see the object in the shadow? Aaron, can you see what it is? So it's an attractive young girl of 16, is it? No? What is it? What age is the person? Are they 20 or 80? 60. All right, that's very <laughs> sweet. All right. Now, some of you won't get it, but I'll show you an easier one later. But do you notice that as I fade out the dark area, leaving only the line. Those of you who can see the face of the old person here will not see it here. It's gone. You need to shade in in order to see shadow and color patches on surfaces. So here's an easier example. Probably everybody can see this one. And you notice here's the negative. It's quite tough. When you have a line drawing of the positive, so these, all the shadows are dark, that's positive. When you have a line drawing, you notice this becomes incomprehensible. This severely shadowed region is just visually incomprehensible. If you only showed that part, people would have no idea what it is. And they can tell you, well, I know what it's supposed to be, 
if you put the rest in, but it doesn't look like it. Whereas when the black is fully present, there is no trouble whatsoever in seeing the surface arrangements. Uh, they discovered these properties of lines 50,000 years ago in the caves. Uh, probably they discovered them in southern um, Africa, in the Drakensbergs Mountains, and we probably have pretty close to a continuous record of picture making in the Drakensbergs Mountains of South Africa from about 50 or 60,000 years ago to the present. But these are from Chauvet in France, 30,000 years ago. You see the lines here, and you have no trouble seeing the cracked line for the mouth line, uh, surface, foreground and background, uh, background and foreground, lots of places. There's the tail, so that's ground, foreground, background shown by a line. Here's another really nice case, an auroch or ox uh, from France. Uh, this is from Lascaux. And you'll notice a very thick line here, and I'm going to point out something weird. That is, when you look at a line when it's thin, you probably just take the line is the border of the object. But if it gets thick, then visually you're tempted to use the inner contour as the border of the ox. Or maybe you want to use the outer contour, and there's an ambiguity. But when you get to the horn, it's really clear that there are two contours, one of which ends two-thirds of the way up the horn, and the other of which is for the tip of the horn. And you use the outer contour for the border of the object. So sometimes lines are thin, and then you just use the line. Sometimes the line gets a little thicker, and then you choose one contour or another. And uh, I think that's what cave artists discovered. So there's only a few elements for perception. They're governed by a few geometries, perspective in particular. Uh, those objects out there are in perspective in vision, but they also have directions from our vantage point in touch. Hence, perspective geometry applies to touch as well as to vision. It applies equally to the two senses. And Pictures use the elements, and the geometries, like from the front, from above, from the side, and we can do that realistically. There is a basis for realism in perception and in making pictures. How do we use um, perspective? Well, when I was sort of a graduate student and an undergraduate, the notion was somehow you had to get rid of perspective in vision, and you had to get through perspective to find the object and then see the object as constant despite all the changes of perspective as it rotates. That was the idea. I think that was a, a bad idea because it meant in psychology we just did not study perspective for a long time. But now I think a lot of us are studying it and this is what I think is the key idea. When you have an object, say one directly below you, it has a certain elevation. So the ground is down there, it's sitting on the ground, and it projects so that each of its edges subjects, uh, projects an angle, and there's a ratio of the two angles. So at a certain elevation, that is sort of 90 degrees below me now, um, it should project, if it's a square, equally in the z dimension or depth, and in the horizontal or x dimension. It should project equally. As it slides away, what happens is it foreshortens, but it foreshortens more in the depth dimension than in the sideways dimension. And so at a given angle of elevation, say 45 degrees, the one-to-one -one has become a much different ratio. And as it goes out, the ratio changes systematically with elevation. And what vision is doing is having an approximation to that set of ratios. So here's a person. They look out to the horizon. An object has a certain elevation with respect to the horizon. There are ratios of the sides projected to the observer. And vision has an approximation to all those ratios built in. So it can calculate what is the proportion of the object. Is that present in vision and also in touch? So this xy dimension, this dimension, the horizontal dimension, the left-right dimension, we can call the azimuth. And what we did with the blind was we had a bunch of targets. This was done by Marta Winusko and Sinyi, who was here visiting. Um, 
uh, graduate students, and we had a blind person go along a trail of targets. They were circles set um, as pairs, and they would feel them. Then they would be taken back to the starting position, and they were asked to point to the targets. And they, re they understood clearly that as the pairs of targets, equally spaced, went off into the distance, they had to reduce the azimuth angle between left and right in the pair. So the near ones, they're fairly far apart in angle. The next pair, which is actually the same distance apart, they know, OK, a smaller extent here in the movement of my arm. The next pair, a still smaller extent. And as you can see, there's a fairly good fit between the actual angle of separation at the shoulder, which is shown by the line, and the uh, azimuth pointing angles of the blind. There's one point that's a little off. Don't quite know why, but you know that's what happens. That's how you know it's real, because it's dirty. <laughs> there's some dirt in the test tube anytime you really do an experiment. Uh, I asked a blind person from Toronto to draw railroad tracks going into the distance and didn't say how they went into the distance. So she drew them converging ahead and converging behind. And so it ends up looking like a shield, doesn't it? From an Ashanti tribesman or something. Wonderful. It's converging ahead and behind, and she writes in here a little V shape. That's where she is standing. Cute. It's a kind of interesting, intuitive understanding of perspective. Something about convergence is relevant. So I asked Eshref from Turkey to draw a table with four chairs around it. Now, this is actually a very good drawing of a table with four chairs. I think very few sighted people can achieve this level. David, you happen to agree? <laughs> Thanks. And this is, as you can tell, six glasses, two rows, three each. The glasses are marching across the table. When he draws it, he draws the further ones smaller. He actually makes the top of the glasses be a little more elliptical. He has overlap of the further ones by the middle ones. I mean, this is really quite a good little drawing. It's very nice. I would like to have a t-shirt with that drawing up somewhere here. It's cute. OK, we asked for cubes. And so Sharif and uh, Kim are now working on this in vision. Uh, you may notice a cube here balanced on a point. This is a drawing by a blind man from Ankara. He has never had eyes. He has had no visual input, optical input whatsoever. But when you ask him for a cube, balanced on a point, he draws it very well. And when I wrote this up, I said, notice he made all of the angles at the top be 90 degrees. And then I thought, oh, no, I better measure this. Because lots of people have made mistakes about what's on the picture surface. So I measured them. And sure enough, the top angle is close to, say, 110. And the angle to the side is an acute angle, probably about 85 or 80 degrees. These are actually 25 or so degrees apart. But vision has real trouble seeing that. So Kim and Sharif have been running experiments on this. And it's an absolutely reliable illusion. And we're exploring the conditions. If you move the cube to the side, so it shows the front and the side, um, Eshref drew a square type form, squarish form, for the front, and a narrowing, a narrowing side, which is compressed with respect to the front face for the side face. He called it narrowing. At least, that's the translation from Turkish that I was given by the translator. And a cube that is moved to the side and down. Here, I think he's much closer to parallel perspective than to converging lines. And it might even be slightly diverging, which is a common phenomenon in the Italian Renaissance, as people struggle with perspective. OK, so I asked him for a house at, uh, at a three-quarter view, vantage point. So the house sits in front on the table. And I say, OK, you're above it. And there's a corner projecting toward you. Corner, not front or side, directly in front. Can you draw that? So he draws it. It's pretty much in parallel perspective. And then he says, you know what? There's a better way to draw that. And he draws the, the corner with converging sides 
to the left and the right. Wow, that's converging in two directions. That's two-point perspective, whereas the table narrowing is just one point. It's only narrowing in one direction. I thought that was very impressive. Now, if you draw in correct three-point perspective, you end up with funny drawings for the sighted. Sighted people say, this looks weird. A cube that's directly in front of you looks OK in perspective. If you're above it, it should be narrowing down slightly. If it moves to the side, it should actually narrow in the same direction. Hmm. Starts to look weird. Now, why does that work? Let me try to give you an intuition. You are Spider-Man. You are swinging above the Empire State Building. You are taking pictures for the Daily Bugle, and you tilt your camera and take a picture. What happens? Well, that Empire State Building has to go down, 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 narrower and narrower to the sidewalk. But the buildings on either side also have to converge downwards, much as if they were railroad tracks all converging in the distance. So that is actually the shape that you would get. And most sighted people don't know to draw that. They only know to draw the one in front of them. They can't do the ones to the side. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote about this, and he said, these are marginal distortions. And he said, don't show them. <laughs> and that's Leonardo's contribution to the science of perspective. Don't show it. <laughs> only show the stuff in front. OK, I've drawn in three lines, a red set, a um, blue set, and a green set showing converging in three directions. That's three-point perspective. There are only three dimensions to space. So if you can draw in three-point perspective, you can do everything. This is the pinnacle. So I asked Eshref to draw three cubes, one in front, one to the left, and one still further to the left. Notice that he drew the one in front, converging up the page. The one to the side is also converging in roughly the same direction. And the one most extremely to the side is converging in the same direction. They also all tilt to converge downwards. And this and this are smaller than the one in front. That's convergence to the side. He's converging in three spatial directions. That's one of the drawings that sighted people in my class can't copy. <laughs> cover, show it, cover it, ask them to do it, and they can't do it. He's at a level of sophistication that's above most sighted people. Remember that, Yong? Yeah. <laughs> it was terrific, fascinating. And we should do studies on that. So I took him to the, uh, with Discovery Channel paying, thank God. <laughs> took him to Florence, sat him in front of the baptistry, where perspective was discovered in about 1413. And he sat there, and I said, please draw the baptistry. I took him over first, let him feel corners, let him feel the edges of the building, took him back, gave him a model of the building, and said, can you please draw this building? There, there's me handing the model to Eshref, who's sitting at this little table, and Discovery Channel is there taking pictures. And we say, please draw this building. Can you show it so that the roof is high above you? And there's his drawing. Isn't that nice? Converging left and converging right. When he first started to draw, as he tried to figure it out, he drew this, which is converging up as well as left and right. And it has extra sides as he's kind of figuring things out. Then he goes back and draws the, the drawing of the building. So metaphor in pictures. He's got everything right. He can use the three spatial dimensions. He can do all the lines properly for all the possible uh, foreground, background configurations. But now what can you do? Well, once you can do everything right, time to violate those things and do something extra. So let's do that. This started in 1810. This is Buick, Northern England, 1810. He's the first person to draw the spokes fading out to show motion and curved lines of motion in the wheel. Once he starts, it spreads. It spreads around the world. Everybody picks it up. They start using it spontaneously. It works astonishingly well without people being taught. These are metaphoric ways of showing things. This is the stuff we see now. Multiple hammers when only one hammer is meant. In language, we say Conrad's jailers have hearts of stone. And we mean this metaphorically, that x and y have some common apt features that we want to stress. 
And so we choose these two objects, we join them with the copula is, x is y, and they don't really fit together, but there is a common feature that you twig, and you say, okay, literally it isn't that, but has that common feature, that's what he wants me to think about. Now, you can do that with pictures too. So here's Erico, uh, totally blind, blind from early in life, discouraged from drawing by her teachers in Japan. She's quite annoyed at them, as you can imagine. Then she goes through Canada several years here, goes to Germany, meets an elementary school teacher who had a couple of blind children in her class. And El Kazolich says to Erico, why don't you try drawing? So she starts. We actually have her very first drawing. It's an advent wreath. She uses a raised line drawing kit. She takes it on holidays. She draws a lot, lots of places. Here is a set of drawings, a suite of drawings, my impressions of Mexico. So this is a glass, obviously, with straws, obviously, with water levels, but liquid levels. But it's tequila. So how do you show it's tequila? So she adds a whole lot of waving, curving lines. And she says, that's the effect of tequila. <laughs> <coughs> then she sits at the table with her husband, Michael, and the mariachi band comes and plays around. So oh, she wants to draw the mariachi band. This is the trumpet. These lines are just radiate out and fill the top space from a single point. And if you look very carefully, you will see wavy lines. That's the violin. And you will see castellated lines. That is, ones that have lots of little right angles. That's the guitar. And over to the side, there are lots of parallel lines. And that's a percussion instrument. Then she goes to Isla de la Mujeres and swims off the coast in the sea. And this is her drawing of herself from above, her hair, the back of her swimming costume, her arms and legs, but from the hands and feet, there are spider webs of lines coming in addition to the wavy lines for the water. What are they? She said, that's the feeling of the water going through your fingers. And she said, this expresses the joy she felt swimming off the coast. And then she went to Australia. This is an excellent perspective picture because this is the dots of the ground in a desert. And the desert has pinnacles in it. So the pinnacles are drawn in. And the pinnacles get smaller, higher in the picture. They're getting smaller, higher in the picture. This is good perspective. There are also little twiggy trees. There are also little fierce little bushes. And there are little occasional lines for light occasional winds. And then the metaphor for thoughts. It says at the bottom, the afternoon, the wind. It's got the date. It's got her initials. She does this with all her pictures. You can see the coffee cup. She's sitting on her balcony, thinking, Japanese. I'm here in Augsburg, in Germany. I need to get a job. I'm a librarian. I am blind. <laughs> How am I going to get a job in Germany? You know, it's going to be tough. I'm going to make friends. What's going to happen? How do I get into this? Huh. So she's thinking a lot. And she's having her coffee cup on the balcony. And she feels the heat coming to her hand. There's a water liquid level, the coffee, in the cup. And then surrounding it are these wavy lines. She said, those are my thoughts. I couldn't solve my problems. Just went round and round. And every now and then, there's a zigzag line. Every now and then, I sighed very heavily. Couldn't solve my problem. Wonderful girl. So she described the Isla de la Mujeres drawing as having metaphors for the sighted, those lines for the feeling of the water going through her fingers. She said, those might be metaphoric for the sighted, but they are perfectly literal for the blind. Because you can feel, she didn't say this part, but here's my analysis, you can feel the edges of a stream of water, but you can't see them in the water. But you can feel them. Is this futurist? Is it like medieval uh, works in which 
things, uh, thunderbolts descend from the sky, trailing clouds behind them? Is it expressionist? What are her influences? Well, Elke, I know, is kind of a German expressionist influence teacher. She says to her, all of her little kids and to Erico, draw, draw anything. Anything you draw is good. It expresses your inner feelings. It expresses you. It expresses your spirit. Anything you do is right. That's German expressionism. She doesn't teach her techniques. She's just interested in whatever Erico produces. There is Erico and there is Michael. Diderot in the 1700s wrote that a blind man from Puiseux recognized profiles drawn on his hand. So somebody would draw somebody else's profile on the blind man's hand, and he could recognize it. Alas, nobody thought much about that until the last couple of decades. Nobody tried to say, what can a line stand for? What are all the possibilities? How does that work in vision? How does it work in touch? But I think this is actually a very provocative, interesting question. I, th I think it suggests a lot, much like looking at an apple fall and saying, oh, I wonder why that fell. <laughs> Eventually leads you to solve all kinds of problems. I think we should have asked that question in the 1700s. And we could have. Here is roughly a theory. I don't have a very good theory. I just have a kind of a count, a discussion. That if you have a dotted line, you can do all the same things with dotted lines that you can with solid lines in drawings. And so both of them must be triggering something which you might think of as a kind of filament that has the information for continuity in it. There is no continuous line joining the dots, like there is for that one, but it triggers somehow the same thing. So there's something that is continuous, some information about continuity is triggered. They're triggered by solid lines, dotted lines, and presumably surface edges, the patterns that come from surface edges. Filaments, those things that those are triggering, they have location, Direction, location with respect to other features. Direction with respect to the observer. They have shape, but they have no brightness and no color. So they can't trigger the appearance of shadows. So the hypothesis, line and surface edge trigger those same filaments in touch as well as vision. We discovered the visual stuff 50,000 years ago. We're now discovering it also works in touch. And that's why tactile lines can show surface edges. So let's go back to TT, Tracy from Toronto. I asked her to draw a little house, same house as I've asked other people to draw, which has this rectangular roof. You notice one point perspective. And then I said, draw the house from up above. And then she used the, the roof as converging. She showed it with converging lines for both the top and the bottom part. That's two point perspective. So Ashraf is three point, but he is not completely solitary. He's the swallow that tells you about the summer. There are people hard on his heels if you just ask the right question. And here is, in inverse perspective, like the Italian Renaissance, the cube balanced on its point, drawn by Tracy from Toronto. So here are what some people think are controversial conclusions. Lines show surface edges, or figure ground, in vision and touch. Perspective is present in vision and touch. And pictures for the sighted and the blind can be realistic or metaphoric. I want to thank several people who've really been making my life this uh, academic year just wonderful. Sharif, Marta, Kim, uh, Justin, who just came in. Heba, where are you? Heba, thank you. Heba and I are going to work with a blind woman in about two weeks, uh, one with color imagery, apparently, that just reappeared in the middle of her blindness. Uh, Sin Yi from Taiwan, and Peter, where are you? there you are, from Information Science. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> now, we do have about five minutes or a little more for questions. David.
Right. And the closure of that sound fits the bigger image. So could, could uh, blind people be taking visual cues from their hearing as well as their touch? I, I imagine so. However, you asked the, the, the first question, which is, what about how are they getting things in touch that have to do with perspective? So let me give you a fairly simple example. OK. So what I need is just two objects. Can I just borrow your Certainly. bag here? Thanks. So if I stand between these two objects, they are 180 degrees apart. Yeah. If I'm at a dinner table, big long dinner table, the corners, the salt, the pepper might be 180 degrees apart as I reach out. But all I have to do is step back a little bit, push back from the table. Now, they're 90 degrees apart. So change in direction uh, with personal motion is a common experience and touch for all people, including blind people. Therefore, perspective is present in touch. Therefore, we can do a lot of studies on you know, how accurate do they understand that you know, the azimuth dimension changes more rapidly than the elevation. Sorry, it's the other way around. The elevation dimension changes more rapidly than the azimuth dimension geometrically. And we find all of those things are true. So in ordinary touch, there is an enormous amount to do with reaching out understanding the directions of things. Now, of course, you're also going to get all those direction things in hearing. Two sound sources on either side of you, walking away from you, will converge in angle. So it's there as an intuition. Now, the next trick is getting it into a representational system that you're controlling, that is, a picture. So how does this bring stuff from a three-dimensional world onto a two-dimensional surface? And it turns out that's just not trivial. That a great deal has to happen in the sighted and the blind to get from, I can draw an object, to I can draw several objects in a space and capture their directions appropriately. And there's lots of stages that are required for the sighted. Um, with a, a graduate student, I did a, a study with 1,000 sighted children, all different ages, Ontario Science Center, and just kind of tracked the emergence of perspective features. Very, very reliable effects, astonishingly reliable. If you look at some things, you get like 85% of the kids doing something at age five. Look again at 14, 85% of the kids are also doing another thing, but it's still 85%. Right. And so there's astonishing reliability to this developmental trajectory for using the perspective that is present in your intuitions all along. Um, then, this nice thing that I used to do in my class, I would show people a wonderful drawing by Eshref, say of the baptistry, and say, OK, now I study it, now I look at it. OK, now I'm going to cover it, now you draw it. And getting this converging on both sides, that alone was enormously challenging for students. People with a certain amount of uh, studio background could whip it out. A lot of the others would say, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Isn't that fair, Priscilla? Young? That's fair. Thank you, Young. You're nodding your head. Free coffee for Young. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I, can I turn to Ronnie? This is Ronnie D'Souza, uh, highly uh, esteemed philosopher. Incredibly little it contributes to 
our third dimension, to our perception of third dimension. I, I, I predict that 3D, 3D will get nowhere any more now than it ever had before. Okay? Because it actually adds virtually nothing to our perception. You know, except that these sort of these objects have come at you to sort of a novelty, a novelty effect. That, that it really adds nothing aesthetically. And I think that's because, and I'd have because perspective does so much more than binocularity in giving us information about the third dimension. Yeah. In fact, you, you, statically, with one eye closed, there's an enormous amount of 3D information in the static perspective. Open a second eye, and you're just doubling the perspective information. So indeed, you can get wonderful tricks out of it, wonderful 3D effects, but the key information is here. The semantics is here. Furthermore, if you do this, then you actually get a whole set of those perspectives, and the motion information is just as good as this static binocular information. Uh, let me just take one step further here. So I was showing you lines can stand for surface edges. We're talking now about binocular vision and motion vision. Now, each of those create borders. The full possible set is static, kinetic, uh, bino binocular, monocular, and black and white versus color. Though that's the full set of sources of borders in vision. It's two by two by two. There are only eight possible borders. And curiously, we have only recently explored some of the combinations. For example, I only know of one. 3D movie where something swims binocularly. That is, if you close one eye, all you see is wallpaper moving around. Either eye. But if you take both of them, suddenly there's an object in 3D, and that object is a shark swimming. And this is on Wikipedia. If you look up uh, binocular vision there, you can have a good look at this unique uh, display. The, the display that has never been made, and that I would like to work with Nick on, is imagine a contour that is purely, purely kinetic in one eye. OK, how do we get that? Well, you know if you were looking at a thrush sitting in the middle of a bunch of leaves, or a pheasant sitting in leaves, you might not recognize any of the borders. You might not see there's an object there. But as soon as it moves, you can see all the borders clearly. And as soon as it stops, they all fade away. So there are purely kinetic borders. You could put a purely kinetic border in this eye and a purely kinetic border in that eye and then see if binocular vision can assemble those. And that combination has never been made. So a lot of the stuff that I've told you about what are the possible set of borders, this is actually new. People just couldn't have said this 20 years ago. And the set of possible borders making them and testing them, that's still a matter of the next five or 10 years, I think. It's instructive. So my notion is there's a finite set of borders, there's a finite set of geometries, and vision uses all of those reliably, successfully, and they're very good at showing you the world. And that's the basis for realism. So when we come to the induction problem in Bishop Barclay, we now have an answer. We can say we know the finite set, we know the finite oh, borders. We know the finite set of geometries. This is how they fit together in the natural environment. And this is where realistic information comes from. So there is a basis in perception for realism. Then the next step is, now you know how to do things realistically. What are all the possible violations of realism? What are the kinds of metaphors that we can make? Can we make the same kinds in vision or in perception as we can in language. I think probably not, but I think that's an, an important problem to explore. It's going to be very exciting uh, playing that game. I would like to see a movie that was called Metaphor, the movie. <laughs> Mary. Uh, present. If you were to show that to some large number of 
blind people who are not themselves artists, would they be able to tell you what that is and so on with, with some of his other drawings? Okay, the experiment that I did on that kind of thing was this. I would give, say, uh, one object, um, table and chairs, and then uh, a set of drawings of cubes, some of which had two-point perspective in them, some of which were just fold-out cubes, uh, some of which were in parallel perspective. And I would say, if a person drew this table, table, square, with four legs coming out from the corners, and said, this is a table drawn from underneath. How would they draw a cube? And then they would go to the cube and the drawings, and they'd pick out the most likely one. And they picked out the two-point perspective one. Second most likely, it's one in which there's a little bit of foreshortening, but it's actually parallel. Third most likely, it's the one in which you show the top and uh, front of the cube. So you select features, but you have no foreshortening. And the least likely one, it's the one where you draw the cube as a set of five squares attached, as if the cube is sort of folded out. And so I ran tests in which I asked people to match drawings of one object of drawings of another object with different systems being used. And the blind people were very successful. Secondly, I would say to them, another group, I've got a bunch of drawings here of objects, and drawn in different ways. Uh, this, this object is drawn in four ways, et cetera, et cetera. This object is drawn in two ways. Which drawing is, drawn by the, is made by the younger person? Which is drawn by an older person? And they always chose the one with more perspective features as drawn by an older person. Um, I think it's also probably, tr well, one more thing. Susanna Miller said, for a Sighted person, it is really easy to look at a picture, and it is very hard to draw. For a blind person, it's probably easier to draw than to identify the picture going through in touch. It takes a long time to work your way through a picture in touch. And so I think my studies with really simple forms, they're very positive. I don't think the door is closed. I think when you get to... Eshref's drawing of the three cubes with all the slants. Most sighted people are confused by it. And I, I, the experiment has not been done. I think most blind people will be confused too. And the ones who have maybe achieved one point perspective might be able to make more sense than the people who've never achieved one point. And the people who can draw in two point perspective might make more sense still. And Eshref is the only person so far, only blind person I've tested, who can draw in three-point perspective spontaneously. And, and by the way, I had seen a lot of his drawings in one-point perspective. And I challenged him with this. Here's a cube in front, cube to the left, cube still further to the left. Please draw them. And he said, this is a new task for me. And then he put his hands in front of him like this. And he stood and he thought for a while. He said, OK. And then he drew. And I think he invented three-point perspective right in front of me. And I think there is a general lesson, not just a lesson about Eshra. That is, if people are at a certain point, and you give them a problem just a one step up, you've conceived the problem. You've given it to them. There's a fair chance they'll solve it. So drawing development involves inventing the problems as well as inventing the solutions. And I, in a sense, the experimenter has intervened unintentionally by giving the problems. But you have to be aware that there may have been that little push as well as the solution from his side. OK, uh, it's now five past the hour. And I promised everybody that this would be a 40-minute talk with a few <laughs> minutes of discussion, which I think is a and a handy, dandy way of putting things together. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>